Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 391st episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, we have a little bit of a unique episode. I've got two guys on. Um, going back to the very first episode, I had a husband-wife team on. Uh, these guys are sales and marketing with a travel company. Uh, it's a subsidiary or started by the founder of Kayak. Uh, they are exploding and having these guys bring their different opinions uh, and approaches to growing a company, uh, I thought would bring a lot of value to my listeners. So we've got a couple guys on this time. We get into uh, working with millennials, the three C's of selling, um, how to interview people when you're onboarding uh, the right team. Uh, And then, you know, several other things, the three rules of, uh, or what is it, the rules of three for your research, which I actually had them repeat uh, so I learned a lot as usual. It's um, the perk of running your own podcast. You get to ask a lot of questions of cool people and learn as you go. If you are needing to ask some questions, if you think I'm a cool person, sign up for the 30daysalesgrowth.com. You can get the on-demand content and then ask your questions of me. Uh, I've also been doing more private consulting. If um, you need more access to me, more input, um, and you want to keep it between us, then um, just go to the Contact Us page at the thesaleswhisper.com, uh, and we can talk. The uh, typical package is uh, just 90 days, and then if you want to renew, that's fine. A lot of people do that, but it's not a lengthy engagement. We, uh, we get engaged before we get married. But uh, that's been a growing component of what I've been doing this year, especially 2019, helping people sorting, sorting sort things out, and um, grow your business. Also, I don't think I've mentioned this in a while, but uh, if you're looking for the right tool, check out the free CRM quiz I've created, uh, bestcrmforme.com. Take the quiz. It's I'm testing different, different options, but right now it's about 26 questions. It's all multiple choice, so it'll literally only take you two or three minutes to click through those. Um, but just that exercise of thinking through uh, who owns what part of the business, contacts, uh, number of leads that you're generating, things like that, Um, what departments need to use it, what other tools must integrate with it. Um, It'll be a good exercise just to get you thinking. Then if you want to talk about the results, then uh, you'll have a link to my calendar as well through that. All right. Best CRM for me. Now let's bring on our guest. Mike and Ryan Lola.com. Welcome to Sales Podcast. Men, how the heck are you? Very good. We're doing great. Yeah, yeah things are going awesome. So I have not had many um, partner interviews. I think my very first one, actually, 380 some odd uh, episodes ago, um, uh, at sales training uh, husband wife team. But you are uh, CEO and VP of sales of a travel company. Is that, is that, did I read that right? Yeah. We're, so we're taking into the next generation. So we do corporate travel. We help uh, companies save money and also save time and uh, give the individual business traveler a much more delightful experience as well. Come on, man. There's Priceline, dude. What? What? Okay. We're, we're going to have to figure this out. Why are we even talking? I'm, I got to, I got to talk to my assistant. If I had an assistant, I'd fire her. This is, this is maddening, but we had a good talk. So, this was started by the kayak guy, right? Yeah, so this guy named Paul English, who's uh, our co-founder. He was also co-founder of Kayak, uh, which obviously is a phenomenally successful business. They built it up, took it public, uh, and then ended up being acquired by Priceline after that. Um, and he uh, knows a ton about the travel industry, knows how to build really good product. And so he started the business with a few other folks uh, a few years ago. And they started off uh, selling to consumers. Um, so it was a B2C corp, you know, travel product and, but all their most active users were people that traveled for business a lot. Um, you know, like yeah. a lot of us here, right. Right. Uh, and, and giving that feedback from their users, they really, it really sort of opened them up to like the B2B world. Right. Uh, lo and behold, sort of, you know, fast forward a little bit. Um, I've known Paul for a number of years and he was looking to add some expertise to the team from someone who knew about. Um, the B2B go-to-market, especially when you're selling to small and mid-sized businesses. Obviously, from HubSpot and some other places, I have a lot of experience with that. Um, and so I joined up um, after having known Paul for a while, uh, about a year ago, 
I started uh, the beginning of August last year. Uh, and then as part of that, um, recruited some new folks to join the team. Um, so Gene Hopkins, who uh, I had worked with at HubSpot, is running marketing. Uh, a woman named Rebecca Morrison is uh, also from HubSpot. She's running uh, finance and operations. Uh, and then we've got Ryan, uh, who joined us early October to run sales. Uh, and so we built out, you know, a decent sized sales organization that's getting bigger by the month. Um, and we've, you know, launched into the market and we're having a lot of success so far. Cool. Yeah, I mean, there's so many lessons just from our couple minutes talking uh, before we hit record. I mean, you were you were brought in because the founder realized uh, to, to to do what he's great at and bring in people that are great at things that he didn't want to do. Right. So you come in to run things. You bring Ryan in to augment sales. Uh, but the overarching thing is finding that niche within the niche. Right? Because so many people would be like, oh, no, I sell, uh, you know, coffee mugs. I'm just the best coffee mug sales company anywhere. Um, I could never sell, I don't know, little containers that hold the cream and the sugar, right? They're like, oh, that's not us. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, <laughs> there's so many things. How, how long did it take them to realize, hey, we got a business within a business that we need to run with? I, I think if you were to ask them, they'd say it probably took them a little bit too long. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I mean, we've been really fortunate that we've gone through our third round of funding so far. And I think Paul was interviewed, this is paraphrasing, don't, don't hold me verbatim against this, but essentially said that we kind of wasted the first couple of years and, and probably a little bit of money along the lines in terms of trying to find the product market fit, trying to find the right sales motion, what exactly uh, the, the right kind of audience was for us in the first place. And the reality is Paul and his co-founder over at Kayak did a phenomenal job of democratizing information for consumers like you and me to get information so we no longer had to go to a travel agent. Um, came to the realization probably 18 months ago or so, maybe a yep. little bit longer than that, but uh, that corporate travel kind of sucks at the end of the day. Like I've used some really, really bad and archaic and draconian like a uh, uh, product in the past just to book a flight from point A to point B. And I've, I've grown some pretty sizable teams overseas as well. And we all ended up going back to kayak because it was such a nice consumerized experience. So that's ultimately what the mission was, was to try and bring all of that in house to help solve for the front end as well as the back end. And generally speaking, we, we serve three personas. We serve the road warrior folks like yourself, myself, whoever else that's out on the road pretty regularly and needs help whenever there's any travel disruption. We end up helping the admin, right? The executive facility, or the office managers who those are the ones who are spending their nights and weekends all the time trying to make changes to the various flights themselves and then finance teams right because it it can uh, finance people tend to dislike salespeople because they might wait a few weeks or months to submit their expenses and receipts and they might be halfway through the next quarter trying to reconcile the previous quarter while their board is asking them about the follow-on quarter so what we want to do is try and give them immediate visibility at a touch of a button to have all that information and, and look like superheroes when they go in and present i've never understood salespeople that did that i mean i've been on my own for a while now but man i got my expenses done yeah. Like, <laughs> that, yeah, that money back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like what the heck? Um, well, well, may, maybe y'all can answer this. Um, but I mean, y'all are brought in on on the new venture. But, but on the flip side of like not recognizing the opportunity, what are your thoughts on people like knowing when to make that leap? Because I see like entrepreneurs at least they have their fingers in too many things. They're the jack of all trades. They're an expert in none and they're terrible and they crash because they're trying to do too many things versus staying narrowly focused. Yeah. Yeah. You know, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Like how to, like when to know, like you've totally nailed your core business and now it is time for that side hustle or to branch into a new vertical or, or spin off. I, I'll let Mike kind of expand upon this as well. The way that I, um, one of my favorite sayings and something that I try and live by is the most undervalued virtue is discipline. So the idea of really understanding what it is that you're trying to accomplish and why, and not necessarily chasing after something shiny too quickly. I mean, we've certainly made our mistakes here at Lola, but I know that Mike and I can both speak from experience in terms of advising other companies as well, where they might be chasing after the money, but not necessarily the mission. They might be chasing after something that seems like they'll be able to exit and cash out really quickly as opposed to really staying focused. And I actually think our, Mike's a perfect example of this, but our experience over at HubSpot is really indicative of that as well. Because a lot of the, the 
advisors that were trying to bring you guys upstream in, in the early days as well. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, we got a, for our first round of financing in HubSpot, we got uh, a couple of different investors were interested and one of them wanted us, they said, we love everything about the business, except you need to go to the enterprise. Forget about the small business stuff, you know, go sell to big companies, sell them the same vision, rebuild the product a little bit for bigger companies and just go up there. And we ended up, I think, smartly not taking their money because we knew anytime there was any faltering in the business, they weren't really aligned with the vision. And they would always say, oh, you missed the number because you're not going to the enterprise, yeah. right? And we just weren't aligned there. And so, right. you know, I, I think to the point around, it's important to find your focus and stick with your focus. And then at the same time, once you feel like you really mastered your focus, to add on other things around that. Like if you look at, you know, the example of HubSpot, of starting off in marketing and then doing sales and service and all these other products, that's really about driving your growth. So I think, I think what you need to do is sort of plan a year to 18 months ahead of growth slowing off in the market that you're in and make sure you enter a new one then because it takes you a little time to figure out these new markets. Right. Um, that would be my sort of advice. Like it's, it's hard to do, but you need to kind of forecast out the growth and, you know, um, in order to keep, making sure you're adding new growth engines to your business over time. Yeah, it's those S curves that yeah. we used to talk about, right? So the first part of the S curve is, is difficult because you're trying to find that product market fit and then you might take off and accelerate your, your overall velocity, whether from revenue, customer acquisition, whatever it might be. It's so whenever you notice that maybe things, they haven't slowed down yet, but you can see based on some of your leading indicators that there might be some friction points in the future. That's when you need to make sure you're making your bets on the next one for sure. How do you have the courage to keep looking at the numbers? Because I know smaller companies, it's the old adage, right? If I ignore it, then it'll probably just go away, whatever that problem is, right? Uh, your typical entrepreneur, I know I've fallen into this. I, I've had to learn and I've had to hire people. I just want to sell. I want to be on stage. I want to make videos, blog, whatever. Like, oh my gosh, accounting. Uh, analytics, pipeline reporting, like, oh, dude, I, I, I just feel it. That deal's coming in. Let's go to the next. No, you need to dig in. You know, how do you balance that, um, the analytical left side brain with the creative right side, just go burn it all down and make stuff happen? Uh, I, I'm sorry to keep answering first here, but I, it's the same thing that I've told my teams for the last, 10 or 15 years that it's um, it's not about you and I's relationship. I'm not thinking about you necessarily. I'm thinking about the other 40 or 400 or 4,000 people that we're trying to build this business for. And without actually being forward thinking and looking into the data and being able to get some sort of leading indicators again and, and analyze along that approach, you can, you can have a fine career if you kind of go deal to deal or, or just go and close stuff. But if you're trying to build a pillar company or a legacy company, you need to know what's worked in the past and, and, uh, that's the way you train yourself to kind of see around corners in the future as well, from my experience at least. Yeah, I think looking at the numbers comes with discipline and helps drive discipline. Um, so I think those two concepts are really sort of intertwined. Um, and I think it's hard for a solopreneur to be that multifaceted. And I'm not, a lot of people do it and a lot of people are very successful with it. But I think the smaller your team is, the more difficult it is. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the luxury of having the funding and the support to have a larger team. And we've definitely got people here that are more intuitive and more analytical. But um, we've got some people that are deeply analytical and help us stay focused on the numbers when needed. Uh, but the smaller your team is, you know, down to solopreneur, it, like it's hard. It's right. hard. It's easy. You got to do it because that's where that discipline comes from, but it's hard. Yeah, the yeah. other side too is that you can have paralysis by analysis. I've certainly worked with a lot of individuals who all they do is focus on the, the analytics and the data itself, and that, that kind of inhibits their decision-making and they need to rely on you know just one more set of, of, of uh, data. So there are times that you just kind of have to make a, a gut call and kind of go with it. I think that you know Mike and I both tend to be a little bit more passionate or emotional in terms of our leadership style in a lot of ways, but uh, we certainly try and surround ourselves by people. I always want to be the dumbest guy in the room. I kind of ascribe to the uh, the Jack Welch approach, right? I want to be the dumbest guy in the room and make sure that, you know, the people that I've hired are helping lift uh, the entire organization moving forward from there. Yeah, Mike, Mike did tell me you were the emotional one, but you know, I don't want to get into that right now. <laughs> well, I got my tissue right here in case I start breaking out into tears. So, <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> I want to talk about that. It was interesting how, 
the company, the original company was focused on the consumer, but buried within that was were these business people. And, and I always tell people, and I wrote a blog post about this a long time ago, and I say, oh, it's, it's nothing personal, it's just business. And I'm like, BS, it's all personal to me, man. Yeah, you know, Dell Inc. Like years ago, I got a big contract with Dell. Well, Dell Inc. wrote it to, to TSW Group Inc., but it was, John signed it to Wes. Okay. That was per, I got to know John. I got to know Julie. That was personal. And if I lost that deal, it was personal. You know, how do we, how do you balance that? Right. How really, how can you, how can we leverage that realizing that behind the title of CEO, VP, you know, on and on, there's a human being there that we can use to accelerate sales. Yeah, I think, that's something we think about a lot because like Ryan said, we may sell into the finance department, they may buy our products, but it's all the employees of the company that use it and they can all leave us reviews, give us good or bad feedback. Um, and we've really focused on because of our consumer heritage, having a great customer experience for those folks. And we actually, there's a VP of finance at one of the, our customers who um, told Ryan and I recently that this is the first time he's ever rolled out a product from the finance team to the whole company where people didn't complain about it and not only didn't complain, but they actually sent him like positive feedback. It's like the first time they thanked him for rolling out a new tool. And normally the finance department doesn't get that. And that helps us drive a lot of word of mouth. So I, I think to me, the way to think about using those positive personal interactions and treating people more like people than this sort of um, faceless enterprise or faceless company is what's going to drive your word of mouth referrals. It's going to drive your more positive reviews online. And maybe it's a little hard to directly measure that stuff, but it absolutely does drive more business. We see it a lot. Um, and we leverage our reviews and our positive word of mouth a ton in terms of how we market and how we sell. Yeah. And I mean, getting back to your point a second ago as well, like, yeah, John might've signed over the check to Wes. Um, and of course I don't know the background of that story or anything along those lines, but in, in my experience, the idea of being transparent and honest and upfront with somebody from the very first conversation allows you to take things a little less personally because of what the expectation has been from the very, very beginning. So back to that CFO, I think part of the reason he loves us and part of the reason that the rollout went so great is because we didn't sit there and tell him that, yeah, you guys can fly to the moon for $3 and 50 cents. I mean, it's not a matter of overselling what it is. It's more a matter of identification of what the true needs of the organization are and letting them know what you can and can't do. And also letting them know like what this relationship is going to look like as you kind of move forward from there. Would you say is is business more casual nowadays? You know, you look back at like Mad Men, right? Everybody was in a three piece suit, very formal. Everybody had an assistant, blah blah blah. And now people, you know, they're showing up in in flip flops and shorts. And is, is it that, more casual on the outside, but it's still business, or is it? Yeah, I I think that's right. The other thing I'd say is um, most of the business back in those days by necessity of how the world works was sort of confined between, you know, eight and six or whatever hours. And maybe there were dinners and things like that, but it was all kind of set. Now I think there's a lot more sort of like merging and intertwining of personal and business, um, you know, because of these, you know, these devices that we all carry around where I can do almost my whole job from my phone. In fact, I use it probably 10 times, if not 20 times more than my laptop. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm docu signing documents. I'm doing video calls with people. I'm on Slack. I'm on email. Um, there's all sorts of things that I'm doing and that may be at 9 PM. It may be in the middle of the day, like while I'm running out to get a coffee and I'm texting as I'm walking down the street. Um, and so I think it's less, uh, what's the other side of it being more casual is that there's no longer sort of like business hours anymore. Um, you know, which is good and bad. I think it also sort of like the personal life bleeds more into your day to day yeah, as well. Creep on that too, it's just, yeah. you know, it's kind of like you got to be careful how to balance those things. Um, but I think there's more of this expectation that sort of people are much more always on, which I think is what's forcing the business side of things to become a little bit more casual. Right. Have you faced any challenges in onboarding salespeople? Uh, do, do millennials get a bad rap? <laughs> No, we've been absolutely perfect, and you can apply it. Um, <laughs> and we'll sell you the training yeah. course for $10,000. <laughs> you remember that expectation setting earlier? Just send a blank check, too. Uh, 
Yeah, no, I do think millennials get a bad rap. I'm, I'm the first to say that. And I know there's a difference in generations, but I don't, I don't know. I, I think that in my experience, at least, people want to care about what it is that they're doing and they want to have a belief in, in the organization they're working for. I think that's truer of today's new college graduates and folks who are sub 30 years old than it might have been before. Uh, I am certainly not a millennial based on the year that I was born, but I kind of have that millennial affiliation in terms of having a belief in, in what it is that I'm doing. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the way that I would look at it from, from that perspective. I, I, I would just say it. out of any generation, there's people that work hard and there's people that don't. Yeah. And um, in sales, it is a job that requires a some amount of hard work and you need to figure out through your interview process who the hard workers are. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you know, and it doesn't mean that people that have made life choices to work less hard aren't good people. It just means there's certain jobs that I think they're not as well suited to. Um, so I think a lot of it just really boils down to sort of um, managing and coaching your team in the right way, given the talent that you have and making sure you do a great job in recruiting and sort of getting the right people on the team. Yeah. But it also goes back to earlier, like, you know, when talking about the solopreneur and how they have to wear so many hats and do so many things that that is kind of the situation that we're in right now from a sales perspective, right? Mm -hmm. In terms sure. of, you know, we just hired our first sales manager a month and a half, two months ago. Um, whereas before I was sales manager, VP of sales, sales director, L and D, I was doing enablement, doing everything all at once. So yeah, we're fortunate that we have the, the, the ability to bring in some additional folks on that front. But I think trying to make sure again, that you're not thinking about today and just into tomorrow, but you're actually thinking about six months from now, 12 months from now, two, five years from now, how are you trying to build the organization to make sure that it's scalable and you can always go back in and audit and inspect against it. And it, there's a lot of, it's like sales also isn't one thing. I think, you know, there's a certain unique things that we talk about a lot in terms of our recruiting profile that are selling, you know, it's a high velocity sale. You got to close five to 10 deals a month to hit your number and you're selling from, you're representing a brand that isn't that well known in the market yet because we're at the early stages. Um, and there's things that are peculiar to that sales process and skills you need to be successful there. First, if you're selling a much larger, higher ticket item, more of an enterprise sale, you know, you may need to close only a couple deals a quarter in order to hit your number. And maybe you're selling that from a really well-established brand like IBM. That's a different, you know, sort of thing. There's going to be a lot more upselling, cross-selling, sort of account management kind of stuff that goes into that kind of sales job. And so, again, I think it's um, it's really about everyone finding the right job that's suited to them and the skills that they bring to the table. And I think there's a lot of times where we interview somebody, we're like, that, that person's actually really good, mm -hmm. but what they're good at isn't going to make them successful here. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What works in B2B? Does outbound still work? Or is outbound dead? Is email dead? Is cold calling dead? Is SEO, PPC, API, ROI, KPI, are those all dead? It's all it's all dead. Conversational all dead. marketing's dead too. Like they're all there's nothing <laughs> there's nothing new anymore, man. No, I, I think um, to a certain degree, I think here's what happens. A brand new channel is created through technology or through marketing, trying new things or whatever. And then it kind of like runs its course. And I've always felt like as a marketer, you get the abnormal returns when you're early on those trends. Yeah. And if you're late on the trends, you'll get average, you'll get results, but you'll get average results. Right. So I think some of the things that are a little bit more on the upswing right now is some of the more traditional stuff. Um, again, if you have the right sales uh, size and can find the customers in the right places, some of the more traditional stuff can be effective. It's kind of been ignored for a little while and it could be a little interesting to break through the clutter. I did a lot of physical direct mail in my last job. Um, yep. Actually really effective in appointment setting uh, in conjunction with a BDR team for enterprise accounts. Um, uh, I think we're finding that a lot of traditional word of mouth, good reviews, just good brand reputation really helps us here. Um, I do think, you know, some of the stuff around moving from forums to more live conversations on your site, um, you know, are actually effective as well. We have some good success about that. Like a lot of our, a lot of our demo requests, actually the better ones that close more often are the ones that tend to chat in and things like that. Yeah. What, what so, I would yeah. say is that I totally agree with what Mike's saying, but for me, it all comes back to how well are you doing any of those channels in the first place? Just yeah, because yeah. like if you come up with a template email and all of a sudden it's working great for our business, but Wes, if you were to take it and use that same templatized email just with a couple of different words, it's probably not going to work for your business. But that doesn't mean that email is dead. It means that your message sucked. That's, <laughs> that's what it comes 
come back to. Yeah. So, I mean, there's all kinds of different messaging. I mean, what, eight years ago, social uh, selling was the, the big deal and you were on the forefront of that and everything. But I get so many crappy messages through LinkedIn each and every day just because it's misguided and they don't actually know what, what my potential needs are. So what, what we tend to think about, and I know it sounds corny, but uh, competence, confidence, and uh, credibility are the three C's of sales for our, our sales organization. Because if you can go into each and every conversation trying to at least establish those, then you're coming across as an educator or a consultant. And I quite frankly don't care if it's based on a cold call or a video email or a social outreach or you know whatever it might be. It's a matter of at least trying to educate and, and help that individual identify challenges and pains that they may not know existed in the first place. I wish to God that we got you know, a thousand demo requests for every sales rep that we have and that every single one of them were just trying to throw money at us. But the reality is even with the demo request coming through the website, you have to understand the why behind that request in the first place and have a proper conversation with them. Yeah, yeah I feel like for the marketers, it really, it's much more about just like Ryan said, like how good you are at these different channels. And, uh, and there really are no shortcuts, like just yeah. putting, you know, chat up on your website isn't going to solve all your problems. It's like, well, what are the messages being posted in there? How are you using it? What are the things you using to drive site traffic to your site? All those types of things. And I always uh, tell marketers, it's like, you want to get so good that you know the playbook so well that you can bend the rules of the playbook. It's sort of like that scene in the matrix where like um, Morpheus and Neo are sort of doing their initial fight, like in the matrix to like practice basically. And at one point Morpheus goes to Neo and he's like, do you think that's air you're breathing? And it finally dawns on Neo that like the entire world he's currently living in is made of code. He's like, he doesn't need to breathe. He can change all the, like it's just, it, it totally unlocks everything for him. And you want to get so good that you realize that and you get to that level. And that's where you, as a marketer, you really get those excess results. It's not, you want to learn the playbook so you can um, do something different than the playbook. You know, it's like the great NFL quarterbacks walk up to the line and they know what the play is, but then they read the defense and they call it audible because they know the thing is even better than the play that they had in their head. And that's the level you got to get to. And if you do that, then you're doing an awesome job. Oh, no, man. Gary Vaynerchuk said three years ago that 95% of my money should be focused on Snapchat marketing. I, I'm not shifting till I make that work. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> The new thing is, uh, I don't know, you know, Instagram, right? Oh, man. Yeah, there's just so <laughs> many yeah. silver bullets. I, yeah. mean, but... I, I saw this meme. And said, the girl says, I'm a model. And the guy says, oh, really? What agency? Well, uh, Instagram. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Says, what do you do? And he says, I'm a sniper. Oh, really? Which branch of the service? Call of Duty. <laughs> uh, uh, Ryan, what were the three C's? Confidence, competence, and what? Credibility. Credibility. All right, I'm writing those down. And credibility comes from credibility comes from doing your research before you ever pick up the phone or start to draft the email, right? So, yeah. what's what's the role, of the industry, and the compelling event that you're even trying to reach out to them for? So, I mean, if you don't have that kind of information, then you're kind of wasting your time. Yeah. Um. So, which brings up, like, is there really any ever? Is there a cold call? Does that exist anymore? Oh yeah. The access we have to information. I mean, it's not truly cold. Right? You may not be expecting my call, right? But if I've done business with 10 of your competitors, you know, your same industry, aren't you kind of welcoming that call once you understand what the heck's going on? Yeah, I don't, I, to your point, I don't think that there's such a thing as a truly cold call anymore, right? I mean, just access to information. Listen, if my sales reps have not spent uh, it's like the three by three terminology. Spend spend three minutes trying to find three compelling events or three interesting uh, things about the individual. Before I met with Mike for that coffee, you know, ten months ago, whatever it was, I certainly spent at least three minutes on his uh, LinkedIn, and we had worked together for seven years already, right? So, but at least going in and identifying, okay, I remember he went to this school. This is his background. This is what he did before HubSpot. It's what he's done since. Just trying to get a better sense as to who the, that individual is, so you at least have some level of commonality or some some rapport that you can build. Now, rapport is not necessarily relationship sales, right? Like people don't buy on that, but at least you can identify what the proper mindset of the individual is and you can start to jump into it. And you do gain some credibility just by knowing a little bit more about them. As an example, right, when we got on this call, I noticed that it said Go Tigers on, on the screen. I'm a huge Oklahoma Sooners fan. So if I were cold calling into you and I had seen on your LinkedIn that you went to LSU or you were a huge LSU fan, you know I'm gonna bring that up in the first 30 seconds to minute of the call because that's at least an icebreaker to where you and I have commonality as human beings. Yeah. Amen. Uh, but do you think it's over 
played, at least maybe by rookie salespeople. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Mike shared a video uh, email that he got probably three or four months ago, which fortunately I forgot the guy's name and the company itself because it was easily one of the most atrocious video emails I've ever seen in my life. And it, I mean, it was just so poorly crafted. Didn't really know what Mike had done or why we would even talk to them or anything like that. So it can certainly be done really, really poorly. It's got to be genuine in nature. It can't be disingenuous. Yeah, I mean, I think if I remember right, I think that one, I get lots of prospecting messages like this, like, hey, you know, you may not have heard much about inbound marketing or like how to generate leads using the internet, but I can totally help you with that. Oh, and tell, yeah, and it's like, like you, you're just proving that you didn't spend two minutes on my LinkedIn, yeah. not even two, two seconds on my LinkedIn. And it just, it, it completely removes any credibility you had. And yeah. I think the smarter folks would sort of say, Hey, like I saw you have a whole background in this. You might not expect that we could help you, but actually here's a couple of things that we've done for that. You know, there's ways to use it. It doesn't mean you can't sell to me, but when you've done zero research, um, it just removes all credibility. You assume that the person's sloppy and not hardworking and not disciplined. And no those aren't the kind of people you want yeah. to work with. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, it, the hardest thing to do in sales is get a response in my opinion. So yeah. once you're actually talking with somebody on the phone, it's easy enough and you can start to identify whether or not there's commonality and needs and, and challenges or anything along those lines, but just getting a response. I mean, I, I get reached out to by vendors all the time and I will respond to the ones that have actually done their research. And I had a gentleman reach out to me the other day and say, Hey, my brother's actually at Oklahoma city university. I saw you went to school down there, yada, yada, yada. Now we have no need for his product or service, but I at least gave him a call back and said, I really appreciate the research that you did. I'm not, I, I'm not going to be buying your service or anything, but here's a couple of companies you might consider reaching out to because they might need you. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it, I know it's, uh, don't get me started. <laughs> The junk I get on LinkedIn alone is is mind boggling. Yeah. Uh, how how do you balance that for your team? Like, what instructions do you give them? It, is it a very precise playbook in the beginning as salespeople? Like, you're gonna do this many calls, this many emails, this many blah blah. Once you hit your number, you know, 90 days, whatever, will allow you to start to break the rules of the playbook. You know, is it very prescriptive, or do you give them more bandwidth earlier? So yes and no. I, I've been using this analogy for a long, for probably five years now, but it's, it, I call it the chili analogy or, or metaphor, whatever the right terminology would be. But, you know, everybody in the U.S. especially knows 80% of the ingredients that go into a chili, right? You got your protein, which is usually beef or sausage or chicken, whatever. You got beans, you got water, you got tomatoes, you got tomato paste, yada, yada, yada. But there's a reason there's chili cook-offs all over the country. It's because People bring their own seasoning. They bring their own kind of approach as to how that chili should be made. Here in the Northeast, we can say clam chowder as an example, right? But the, the thing is, I want, what I've seen successful is that all of us are following that 80% rule when it comes to our playbook and what the general expectations are, but the 20% is on you and based on your overall creativity and what you can bring to the job uh, and approach itself. Um, so yes, I mean, we have guidance in terms of what, you know, daily, weekly, monthly KPIs should look like, but I've actually found more success in taking my reps aside. You could reach out to any of my reps right now and they would say, yeah, that's exactly what Ball did. Asking them, okay, how much money do you want to make this year? And let's reverse engineer that based on all the way out to how many dials they want to make. And there's a Bennett who's on our sales team who, you know, he's hard work and absolutely love the kid. I remember going through this exercise with him and he's like, wait, so Ball, you're telling me if I if I just increase my dial total by two each and every day based on the conversion rates, I can make another $7,000 this year. And I was like, that's what the data suggests. So when you know Bennett's been killing it the last <laughs> couple of months, yeah. few months, I mean, I, I want them to come to their own conclusions, not me prescribing to them because there's, there's less accountability, less ownership on that front. Yeah. If you just tell people to do push-ups, they don't really like doing the push-ups. Yeah. If people decide like, I want to look great and be really fit. And they, they're like, oh, if I do more push-ups, that's how I'll get there. Then they enjoy doing the push-ups. Yeah. Yep. And that has to come out in the interview, right? You got you to onboard the right people. Yes. So, but I see most companies, they don't, I mean, they, it starts at, what do they say, fish rots from the head? Right? Yeah. I see companies all the time. My salespeople suck. It's like, you haven't given them any instructions, no right. guidance. You yeah. hire them and say, here's your phone, here's your yellow pages, right? Knock, knock yourself out. No, by the way, you got a million dollar quota. Good luck. Right. You know, yeah, so. I mean, hiring right is, I mean, it's the hardest job we have. There's no doubt about it. I'm, even the best in the world only get two out of three right when you think of it that way. So, 
it's um it is difficult we've tried to and we've learned a lot of this from former colleagues as well but we've tried to be a little bit more formulaic might not be the right word but at least we know what we're looking for in each and every interview based on the attributes and you and i talked about this on our podcast a long time ago as well so we try to be consistent that way we can at least compare candidate against, candidates against one another and those that do get the job based on the scorecards that we put together we can do some level of regression analysis to understand all right we actually need to lean into this attribute a little bit more. This one was a little less important, whatever it might be. So we, we try and take as much of the guesswork out of it as we possibly can. Yeah. Very nice. All right, man. Parting words of wisdom. What should our listeners do after visiting your website? What should they do as a result of listening to this to move the needle, to grow their business? You know, I don't want people just listening, right? People are probably at the gym. They're, they're on a mountain bike as they're listening to this. When they get back to their desk, what should they do to grow? Let's go back to your comment and discipline. I think that's the best thing for an individual. Yeah, it depends on where that discipline's coming from. I mean, that is such a loaded question and it's all circumstantial and based on the individual, but actually getting back to an attribute, and this does come down to discipline as well. One of the things that we really care about is intellectual curiosity or being a lifelong learner. So if you're looking to grow your business, mm -hmm. then make sure that you're trying to learn and better yourself each and every day because it's not just going to happen, right? You got to be like one of the luckiest. You have as much of a chance of winning the lottery as you do building a business and getting lucky without putting the work in. I did. I mean, listen, I've learned so much in the last two or three years and, and we've had some pretty interesting experiences, Mike and I, in terms of our individual careers and lives. Um, but that doesn't keep me from going and, and networking and having drinks with, folks that I greatly respect from very different businesses or, or uh, reading various books or, or listening to podcasts, whatever it might be. It's just constantly trying to take one step after another to better ourselves and at least bring different perspectives into it. And, and I'll sum that up and say, I think that intellectual curiosity means asking someone questions about their business because you genuinely are interested in it and want to understand how it works, not because you're probing for one of the five pain points that your product or service solves, yeah. right? And because who knows what you're going to be selling a year from now or what new things you're doing, whatever. It's just be genuinely intellectually curious about that as opposed to this robot that's probing for one of those couple things that fit your sales model. Yeah, it's not about your methodology or no. your qualification matrix. Yeah. I mean, one of the greatest sales trainers I've ever known, Andrew Quinn, this guy yeah. that we used to work with, he boiled it down to three things. It's like, how do they make money? Do they want to make more money? And can I help them make more money? And those were the only three, because I was struggling when I first started my career. But whenever I just boiled it down to those three questions, sometimes the answer to one of those, the third one is no, you can't help them. Well, listen, I get my time back and at least yeah. I'm not chasing yeah. after something. So yeah. that curiosity is really, really key in my opinion. Yeah. Yep. You got to look for that too, right? You can't, you can't instill that in somebody. It's either there or it's not. Definitely. Definitely. So recruit well. Very nice. All right. Mike and Ryan. Y'all are, uh, are you in Boston? Where are y'all? Yeah, we're headquartered in Boston. Okay. Yeah. So um, stop stealing everyone from HubSpot, all right? I mean, I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I gotta, just steal the bad ones, all right? I'm stealing their stuff, man. Directly from HubSpot, except for one, maybe, or two. Yeah. But, yeah. And I, I haven't done that in a, a few weeks, at least. So. <laughs> So down. Down. They've got like 3,000 people. They won't, they won't even notice we take like a couple more. It's and to be fair, that's right. a great story, but there are so many talented people here in Boston. That's yeah. generally what we're trying to do is just, no, we've hired we want to build a legacy places, killer yeah. company here yeah. in Boston. For sure. I think anybody that's coming from HubSpot, it's more because they um, you know, know someone here yeah. in the past and they're looking forward to working with somebody again. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of great folks. We've hired a bunch of great people from a whole bunch of companies. Yeah. 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 Very cool. All right, gentlemen. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Have a great day. All thank right, you. Thank thanks you. Thanks for having us. You know, I just interviewed Jim Padilla. Uh, his episode will go live in September. But um, he talked about knowing your the pain of your customers, knowing it so well. Uh, because a lot of times our customers cannot articulate their issues, their own pain. And we got into the consultative selling and, and why you got to change things up a little bit. Uh, and these guys kind of touched on that, right? Finding the pain. Know the why for the buyer. Know the playbook so well that you can bend the rules. I love it. Uh, as soon as I wrap this up, I'm heading to jujitsu. And our instructor is that way.
we focus on the fundamentals. It's always the fundamentals. I've had private lessons with him, and we don't cover anything fancy. He refines and drills down on the fundamentals. Because in the moment of you know, getting after it, you can probably do something. Something will come out um, that is unique, that is breaking the rules. But you know the rule so well, you can make that happen. But most people don't want to do that. You know, the old adage is that um, a rookie will practice something until they get it right, and a professional will do something until they can't get it wrong. So do you have that discipline? Are you sticking with it? And it's hard. It's boring. When I get there today, we're probably going to run a few laps around the gym, and we're going to do what they call uh, shrimping hip escapes, probably twice. Uh, we'll do lunges. Okay, we're going to do a ton of sit-ups. Those things are important. When a new person comes in, the very first thing I show them is a hip escape. How to get somebody off of you, create space so you can get a leg in there, get an elbow in there, create some space, push them off, and get away. Or have a new angle of attack. It's not exciting. But then you have people that they suffer, they fail, they lose because they haven't mastered the fundamentals. So do you know the playbook so well that you can bend the rules? Most people don't. All right. So if you need some accountability, you want somebody to push you, like I talked about at the beginning of the show, there's 30daysalesgrowth.com. It's a group training and then there's private training. I don't have a link for that. Just go to the saleswhisper.com, go to the contact us and we'll talk about it, see if it's right for you. Um, because it is not right for everybody, and I don't take people on uh, randomly or wantonly because it is private. You do have unlimited access to me, so uh, I'd have a true limit on that because um, I've got to be available for you, and I've got to be available for my family, for jujitsu, for this podcast, for everything else. So if you want some one on one help, hit me up, okay? But hey, thanks for listening. Uh, please leave a five star review on iTunes, share this with others, help get the word out. Uh, if there's a guest you'd like me to have on or a topic you'd like me to cover, um, hit me up with that as well. I'd be happy to squeeze that in or figure out how to, how to bring that in um, to help you grow your sales. Don't go sell something.